All right, so what I want to do today is I want to go back to chapter two and talk about some of the basic probability rules and what we hope to be getting from this. So we had a wish list, right? And our wish list was we were trying to figure out what would be reasonable for probabilities. So wish list. So the first was we wanted the probability of A to be in 0, 1. And of course, you know, when we say something like this, we have to be careful which events are we talking about. And I had a long discussion on Russell's paradox and the fact that we cannot assign probabilities to every event. Okay? But it turns out that most of the time we can assign probabilities. Okay? If you're a gambler, if you're Las Vegas and you're setting the lines, you want to try to assign accurate <coughs> probabilities to events. Right now, I'm just saying I want some kind of space and I want to associate a number to each element and I want that number to be somewhere between 0 and 1. What do we want the probability of the empty set to be? 0. Probability nothing happens is 0 and the probability that something happens, 1. And then we talked about the probability of the union of the AI being the sum of the probability of the AIs. And we saw that there were some issues with this, that putting this on our wish list was too much. So the danger was uncountable unions. Now the other thing is, just as stated over here, this is far too general to be true. I need some constraints on the AIs. Can anybody give me a natural constraint on these AIs? That the pairwise destroy. Imagine all the AIs were the same set. You imagine every one of them is the entire space. Then this side here could go off to infinity. So here I want disjoint sets. So this means if you choose two different A's, A1 and A5, there's no element in common. And we said that if it's an uncountable union, this is dangerous. We don't expect this to be true. The hope is that it's true for countable unions or finite unions. And what this is basically saying is if we have a bunch of disjoint events, then the probability that at least one of them happens is the sum of the probabilities that they happen. So whenever you see math, you want to try to convert it into a sentence. So whenever you see union, union means at least one. What do you think intersection means? Intersection means, so when I looked at the intersection of the, all of the AIs, what do you think that should be? All of them means all. all right. So that's the difference between the two types of events. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to do an example to try to get an idea of how we might define and assign probabilities. Okay, so this is the expected counts, uh, do they call it probability tree? Probability tree. So imagine you know, toss um, a coin twice, tosses are uh, independent, heads 70% of the time, tails 30% of the time. Okay? So this is the example from the book. What are my possible outcomes? So I'm tossing a coin two times. What are the possible outcomes? Um, all tails, all heads, one head, one tail, and one tail, one head. Okay. So, okay, so, okay. <laughs> so we could have all heads, all tails, head, tail, tail, head. Yeah. Right. So if we want to look at it, that's one way to look at it, and that is a great way to look at it. There are many different sets you can look at. I'm going to look at a slightly different set. Here, my outcomes will be the number of heads. And so if I do that, I'm going to have my 
outcomes are zero, one, or two. That's the number of heads I could get when I do this. This may seem like a minor point, but this is an enormous idea in the subject. It is much better to talk about the number of heads than heads and tails. What are three heads plus two heads? This one you should be able to do. Five heads, yes. Three heads plus two heads is five heads. What's three heads plus two tails? Three heads and two tails. I don't have a way to combine heads and tails. If I assign a numerical value to things, I can now start adding things. I could assign a value of one to head, and which should I assign to tail? One possibility is zero. There's also another good possibility. No, not, not one. One, one. one would be too easy if heads and tails are both one. I'm allowed to discriminate a little bit. I'm in the math department. Negative one. So the head and the tail could cancel each other out. And I could be looking at the excess number of heads. And if I have a head as a one and a tail as a minus one, if I now add all of this together, it's going to be very nice. We want to assign, whenever possible, numbers to things. We can combine numbers. We cannot combine heads and tails. This is the old apples orange adage. Right, so what we're going to do is we want to try to figure out what are the probabilities of these events. So you might be able to do this just by looking from experience. You, well, the tosses are independent. I have a 70% chance of getting a head on each toss. What's the probability I get two heads? Point 0.7 squared, 7 tenths squared, 49 hundredths. The probability I get two zeros. I'm sorry, the probability I get a zero. 0.3 squared or 3 tenths squared. And then whatever one is, that's got to be the remaining. Okay, so we all have an intuition of what this should be. I want to show you a way to get this. This is like the frequentist approach. We're going to imagine we have a huge number of coins, and we're going to just draw a flow tree to see what would happen. If I wanted to, I could start with just one coin, but it's kind of strange to imagine I start with one coin, and then 70% of the coin goes here, and 30% of the coin goes here. How many coins do you think I should start with? 100. That's a really nice number, and for this problem, 100 would be fine. I do not like living on the edge. I like giving myself a little extra freedom just in case I made a mistake in the calculation. Let me make things a little bit larger so I don't have to worry about the multiplication. Let me start off with 1,000 coins. Okay? I don't need to do this. I could have easily done it with 100. Let's take a few extra. So we have 1,000 coins. And on the first toss, how many of them come up heads? 700. And how many come up tails? 300. Now we do our second toss. Of these 700, how many of these end up as heads? I'm sorry? 490. Because each coin has a 70% chance of coming up heads. So this would be heads. So this would be 490. That would be heads, heads. What about over here? How many of them will end up with a tail? 210. And these will be the head to tail. Now over here for the 300, I have two possibilities. How many of them are going to go to a head? 210. And how many of them will end up with tail tail? 90. And if you notice, 490 plus 210 plus 210 plus 90 does equal 1,000. So 490 plus 210 plus 210 plus 90 equals 1,000. All the coins have been accounted for. If I want to calculate what's the probability I end up with you know, two heads, it's 490 over 1,000. What's the probability I end up with two tails? It's 90 over 1,000. So probability, you know, we get 2 is going to be 490 over 1,000. And we can interpret that as 7 tenths squared, exactly as you would expect. Yes? This is like a more suitable method when you have like not that many trials and not that many possibilities. Correct. 
Correct. You would not want to do this flipping the coin a thousand times. Yeah. With even, like for like the dice one on the whole even for the dice one. Correct. One of my professors in college said, you know, I'm going to make you do this painful calculation. You should do this painful calculation <laughs> once so that you appreciate the advanced theory of never having to do this calculation again. And just there is a reason to do a long, tedious calculation so that you appreciate. Uh, if you've ever used the definition of the derivative, you don't really want to go back to the definition of the derivative. And you appreciate all these different rules. Now, there's something that's very interesting in this tree. These two numbers are the same. Is it surprising that those numbers are the same? Okay, so why is it not surprising? Um, because we can derive one, the probability of one by doing 70% times 30 times, and the other one can be derived by taking 30% times 30 times. So they're both, basically, multiplication is commutative. So the order doesn't matter. Okay? And so because the order doesn't matter, these two numbers are going to be the same. And then the question becomes, how many ways can I end up with a head and tail? This is where the binomial coefficients come into play. I can really take this and I can replace this with a 420. Because I don't care if it's head, tail, or tail, head. I just care that these are the ones that have only one head. And what's really looking here is binomial coefficients. Which would you rather do? Would you rather buy a jacket that is marked up 25% and then discounted 30% or discounted 30% and then marked up 25%? I'm sorry? Discounted 30 25 Okay, so what you're saying is, so I have x, I can discount it by 25%, so I now have 3 fourths x, and then I mark it up by 20%, so I multiply by 5 fourths, I'm sorry, by 6 fifths. Or I could first mark it up by 20% and then I could discount it. Which would you rather have? I'm sorry? Which would you rather have? Is there a difference? No. So when you look at, uh, when you go to stores and you see all these clothes that are marked down, the real question is were they marked up first? If they tell you, on sale now, 25% or 30% off, hey, that sounds like a pretty good deal. If you look at this, you get 18 over 20. It's a savings, but it's not a huge savings. Depending on the order in which operations are done, you can be misled easily. My wife is a professor of marketing. If you want to learn more about that, I can easily have her come and talk to the class. But order doesn't matter. When you multiply numbers, you can do it in either order. This is exactly what's going on here. That's exactly why these two 210s are the same. Okay, any other question about the probability tree and the expected counts approach? All right, so what I want to do now is I want to go to Kolmogorov's you know, three axioms of probability. This is the way to rigorously put the subject on a firm grasp. Now, what subject would be really useful to know right now? And for the students who've had me in Calc 3, you have to resist the temptation to say linear algebra. Those days are gone. What subject would be really nice to know right now? Real analysis, measure theory, this is where the analytic methods come into play. And if we want to do all of the stuff rigorously, we want to have a really good language. For the most part, I want you to just be aware of the dangers in the subject and the need to put things on a firm foundation. And for the most part, I just want to play a little bit fast and loose with some of the basics. All right, so this is now section 2.4, axioms of probability. Bless you. So we have Kolmogorov's axioms. Okay, and so what we're going to do is we're going to let omega sigma prob be the set we're going to look at. So what is omega? This is our outcome space. This is our sigma algebra. 
It's the sets we talk about. Okay? So we're going to limit our discussion to the probabilities <coughs> of elements in sigma. So there are some sets whose probabilities we will just not talk about. Okay? This is like my family members who are New York Yankee fans. You know, just some people we just don't discuss. All right? They're not part of the conversation. What's probability? This is going to be a function from sigma to what? <coughs> to the reals is correct, but you can be more specific than the reals. To 0, 1. And what prob is going to do is it's going to assign a probability to every element of sigma. And if it's not in sigma, it's going to say nothing. Okay? And we want it to have the following property. So property 1, or axiom 1. So if A is in sigma, then probability of A is in 0, 1. Seems reasonable. Two, the probability of the empty set is zero. The probability of the entire space is one. So if I'm choosing something from omega, I've chosen something. And then the last one is the interesting one. If AI is a collection of pairwise disjoint elements of sigma and countable, well, I'll say at most countable, then the probability of the union of the AIs is the sum of the probability of the AIs. So at most countable means I'm allowed to consider a finite set, a finite collection of sets. You know, if you want, imagine all the other sets from some point onward are empty. If you only want to, if you're obsessed with working with infinities, just choose all the AIs to be empty from some point onward. They'll still be pairwise disjoint because the empty set has no elements in common with anything else because it has no elements. It's much easier to just put in the phrase at most countable that allows you to take a finite sum. In practice, of course, you would much rather deal with finite sums. It's much harder to work with anything that's infinite. Right. This is the acceptable thing. This is very close to our wish list. The only real difference from the wish list was that we're putting in the phrase at most countable. We are restricting what we can do. For all practical purposes, this is not a bad restriction. Okay? And then it turns out you can develop a really nice theory about this. Now, your theory is going to be a function of what sigma is. So the larger sigma is, the more events you can take into consideration. And so in section 2.6, it goes into some detail about what are possibilities for sigmas. There's what's always called the stupid possibility. Mathematicians typically don't like using the word stupid. We use the word trivial. Okay, so one example is to take sigma to consist of just two things, the empty set and the entire space. And you can develop a theory of probability on this space, but it's going to be boring. The only events you can talk about is nothing happens or something happens. And so this is given the name trivial. There are other examples. If you have a finite set, what you can look at is you can look at all possible subsets. So example, if omega is finite, look at sigma equals the power set of omega. All possible subsets. As long as your space is finite, everything will be well defined, and you can define a probability. Um, so, although our sets are at most countable, we're still allowed to have sets that include. Well, 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 here, 
the number of sets is at most countable, not the sets themselves. The sets themselves could be uncountable. They could be intervals. They could be spheres. They could be balls. We have an at most countable number, number of AI. Okay. So in a situation like this, we would often write I goes from 1 to infinity, I goes from 1 to infinity to denote that it's a countable union and not an uncountable union. The reason I don't want to write something like this is if we only have finitely many sets, I've written a union going up to infinity. And that's why I sometimes prefer not to put the bounds on the unions. Okay. So in a finite set, what this is basically saying is you can look at any possible combination of things. So you know, if I have you know, 15 possibilities, I can look at you know, maybe my, I'm going to get either 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 all the way up to 15. I have one of these you know, Dungeon and Dragon 15-sided die. And I can look at what's the probability I roll a 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, or 13. I want to roll a prime number for some reason. Maybe it's because I'm a number theorist. I can talk about an event like that. Right? If the space is finite, everything <coughs> is OK in terms of something like this. Whenever you have an infinite space, you can no longer just use the power set. And so in the book, it talks a little bit about the Banach-Tosky paradox. This is one of the strangest things in mathematics. You can take an orange. You can chop the orange up into five pieces. If you take a set and you translate it, if you just slide it, do you change its volume? If you spin it, do you change its volume? So you can chop the orange up into five sets so that if you move three of them over here, by translation and rotation, you can combine them and get a full orange without any holes. And you can take the other two and combine them and get a full orange and get no holes. And you've just doubled the orange. Rather than doing this to an orange, you can do this to a brick of gold. I think it's a much better use. A stack of $100 bills, you can double anything. This should shock you. It uses what's called the uncountable axiom of choice. I do not believe in this axiom. Uh, precisely for reasons like this, I think it gives too much power to mere mortals. The only good thing for us is that the construction to double the orange requires you to use what's called a non-measurable set. The set is so bad, you can't even describe it in good terms. So these are not things you have to worry about in real life. OK, so what I want to do now is I want to talk a little bit about some basic probability rules. So there are four main consequences. OK, so I think this is now section 2.5. So basic probability rules. All right. So the first rule, I just want to make sure I get them in order, is the law of total probability. It sounds impressive. The probability of A plus the probability of A complement equals 1. So A complement means A does not happen. It's the event of not A. So again, we had to talk very carefully. If the Patriots are playing the Giants in the Super Bowl, the complementary event to the Patriots winning is not the Giants winning. The complementary event is the Patriots don't win. Okay? What I'm telling you is either A happens or A doesn't happen. Okay? In terms of basic probability rules, this should be filed under the blatantly obvious. Right? It's also one of the most useful ones. What it means is that the probability of A is 1 minus the probability of A complement. OK? This is just simple algebra, but this is amazingly useful. Imagine you want to calculate the probability, let's say I roll a fair die five times, and I want to calculate the probability that I roll at least 1 6. So the probability at least 1 6 in 5 rolls of a fair die is equal to 1 minus the probability of no rolls of a 6 in 5 rolls of a fair die. 
this is an easy event to calculate. What's the probability that I roll no sixes? It's five sixths to the fifth. Whereas if I want to calculate the probability of at least one six, I've got to do the probability that I get exactly one six, exactly two six, exactly three six, exactly four six, exactly five six. A lot more painful, a lot more cases to look at. So frequently, whenever you have the phrase at least one, you should be immediately thinking, oh, I've got the phrase at least one, I want to use the law of complement of total probability. That's a much better way than just going through the whole calculation. Okay. So why would this be true? So, proof. So, I want to try to emphasize why you would attack the problems, why you would attack the proofs the way this goes. So this is a 300 level course, this is pre-core, but a lot of you are going to be math majors. This is you know, one of your first real theory intensive courses. So I want to try to mix of your proving things and my proving things. When we have A and A complement, in some sense this is partitioning the outcome space. Either I'm in A or I'm not in A. So what I'm really doing is I'm looking at the event omega and I'm writing omega as A union A complement. What's the probability of omega? One. And what's the probability of A union A complement? So it's the probability of A plus the probability of A complement as A intersect A complement is empty. A complement by definition is things not in A. So is there anything that's in both A and A complement? No, by definition. And there's the proof. And so we often do a filled in square to mean we've reached the end of a proof. Okay, so this is a proof of the law of total probability. It's extremely useful. Whenever you see the phrase at least, you want to be thinking of using this law. Okay, any questions about the law of total probability? Okay, what I want to do now is I want to spend probably the rest of the class talking about the second result, the probability of A union B. So the book goes through, I think, multiple proofs of why the probability of A union B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersect B. And it talks about generalizing this, it calls it the method of inclusion, exclusion. This is extremely useful. I want to give you a sense of where this comes from. And so again, one of the goals for this class is to help you get a sense of how do you look at a math equation and see what it's saying. So I'll, I'll state the result here. Two, the probability of A union B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersect B. And you can generalize. And this leads to the method of inclusion-exclusion. And we will talk a lot about the method of inclusion-exclusion later in the semester. This is a great way to calculate events. Okay. You were asked to do a calculus problem on your homework. Right? And in fact, it was a calculus proof. And there was a reason I wanted you to do this. I wanted you to think back to some of calculus, practice your proofs a little bit. So recall, if I look at f of x times g of x, and I take the derivative, it's f prime of x times g of x plus f of x times g prime of x. We talked about a wish list for probability. If you had a wish list for calculus, would this be on your list? No, what would you have in calculus on your wish list? The derivative of a product is? Product of the derivatives, derivative of quotient. Quotient of the derivatives, right? You were outvoted. Actually, we're never even allowed to vote. You never even got to that stage. This is the derivative. This is the derivative of the product. 
So I go through in the homework solution key and talk about how you prove this. The main idea is a clever adding of zero. Okay. What I want to do now is I want to talk about why this is a reasonable formula and how you could have predicted this. So how many of you were surprised when you first saw that this is the definite, that this is the product of a derivative? I mean, I, I remember looking at this and going, this is what? What I want you to do is I want you to get a feel of how you can predict formulas. And if you can have some idea of what formula is out there that will affect how you can prove things. So let's find the solution. So we're going to do experimental mathematics. Except we're not going to have to go to a lab. We're not going to have to buy expensive equipment. We're just going to have to use a little bit of chalk. I want to sniff out what the rule for the product is. Are there any functions whose derivatives I know really well? Y equals x. Y equals x. Can you generalize that a little bit more? Y equals x to the? To the 1. <laughs> push, it a little, push it a little bit more than just x to the 1. X, I, to, the n. x to the n. So let's try f of x equals x to the n, g of x equals x to the m, and h of x is f of x, g of x is x to the m plus n. We can use this to sniff out a candidate for the product rule. What we're doing is we're taking two functions we understand very well. They're of a nice form, and their product is also of a nice form that we understand. What's h prime of x? That's just going to be m plus n to the x to the m plus n minus 1. If I have f of x is x to the n, what's f prime of x? That's n x to the n minus 1. g of x is x to the m g prime of x is m x to the m minus 1. I somehow have to get a power of m plus n minus 1 for the x. These are my possible building blocks. What's the only ways I can get an x to the m plus n minus 1? How can I get the right power of x? So I could do f of x times g of x over x. Would that give me the right power? Yes. So I mean, there's lots of different things I can do. But does this feel natural? Does this feel right? This seems very strange. It feels like my answer should somehow involve f g f prime g prime. I shouldn't maybe be using special things like dividing by x. Any thoughts as to how I could get an x to the m plus n minus 1? <coughs> yeah, I could try crisscrossing. These two, if I multiply them together, that's going to give me the right power. And if I multiply these two together, that's going to give me the right power. So if I do f, pri um, f prime of x times g of x, that gives me n x to the m plus n minus 1. If I do f of x g prime of x, that gives me m x to the m plus n minus 1. And if I take the sum, that's going to give me m plus n x to the m plus n minus 1. And that equals this. Is this a proof? Not even close. But does this give you some justification that this formula could be true? And so now when you're trying to prove the product rule, you have a target to shoot for. If you have an idea of what the answer is, this is a huge advantage in trying to do the analysis. You have an idea of how to try to arrange the algebra to pull things out. I've got to somehow do my algebra, and I've got to get like an f prime times g, <coughs> because I believe that there could be something like this. If you want, you could try putting in more exotic functions. You could put in maybe sines and cosines. And you might want to do this. You might want to remember that sine of x times cosine of x would be 1 half sine of 2x. So if you remember something like that, you could then have a better test involving sines and cosines and see does it still work. The danger of doing a trig example is you have to remember your trig.
Okay, and I know a lot of people forget their trig. You might even need to use some trig identities because sometimes different trig functions, I'm sorry, sometimes functions look different but they're actually the same. So what's sine squared x plus cosine squared x? One. One. Uh, sine to the fourth x plus two sine squared x cosine squared x plus cosine to the fourth x. One, I just squared it. Right. I can start playing lots of different games. I could then replace the middle term with like a sine of 2x squared. I could do lots of different things to try to confuse you. So if you try to prove you know, your test using sines and cosines, you might have to do a little bit of trig analysis. But you know, again, when you have a formula like this, I highly recommend doing something like that. All right. Why did I want to do all of this? Well, we have this formula here for the probability of A union B. It's the, we're claiming it's the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersect B. This is not that hard of a formula to prove. But I want to talk about how we could sniff this out and see that this is reasonable before doing the detailed calculations, before doing the proof. This is the skill that will serve you better years from now. You know, I'm sadly speaking from experience, most of my students use very little of the material I've taught them over their you know, course of time. It's just a fact of life. It's very rare that you'll be in an actual situation where you need to use a specific fact. What's important is knowing where the facts are so that if you need something, you know where to look it up, knowing what kind of facts exist, knowing what kinds of problems can be solved, and knowing how to attack new problems. This is the hardest thing to learn, is how do you look at something that's completely new and come up with a way to attack it. This is why in class I want to spend more time going over the thought process, going over how you would attack something, than going through a lot of the tedious algebra. You can read the tedious algebra at home, you can read the definitions at home, and that will free up class time to be used more effectively. All right, so we no longer care about this. This is calculus, calculus is gone. We're just doing basic probability now. So we want to find the probability of A union B. It should be a function of the probability of A the probability of B, and the probability of A intersect B. I can't think of anything else that could come into play. Right? These are the only ingredients. I have the event A, I have the event B, and I have the intersection, the probability that both events happen. Now, how these three numbers come into play in the final formula, that's much harder. But these are, the three, these are the three and only three inputs. And so I could try to write down a formula. Maybe the probability of A union B is C0 plus C1 probability of A plus C2 probability of B plus C3 probability of A intersect B plus C4 probability of A squared plus C5 probability of B squared plus C6 probability of A intersect B squared plus C7 probability of A probability of B plus dot 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 and eventually I get up to you know some constant I have no idea CI <laughs> probability of A cubed you know maybe I guess some kind of formula like this the more complicated the formula the harder it's going to be to guess what do you think we should try as our initial guess? How deep do you think we need to go? Do you think we need squares and cubes and higher? Let's try to just guess, maybe there's some kind of linear formula. So let's guess that there's a linear formula. And now what I want to do is I want to figure out what would those numbers be? Well, this goes back to the baseball problem I gave you, your probability of two teams winning and they play each other. Let's choose specific values of A and B. You may be a smart ass now. What would be a really good choice for A and B? Okay, you can't say zero, you have to say the mathematical equivalent. Uh, empty the empty set. So if A equals B equals the empty set, what does that tell us? This is zero, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero. What can we deduce? C naught is zero. 
If there's going to be any formula like this, the only way a formula like this can hold is if C0 is 0. So there can't be a constant term like this. That's enormous progress. Now again, that doesn't prove a formula like this is right, but this is allowing us to narrow the shape from a really good choice. Can you think of another choice? Okay, so what do we want to take to be the whole outcome space? So if A equals B equals the whole space, that implies 1 equals C1 plus C2 plus C3. Ah, so taking that, we now know that the C's sum to 1. That's extremely useful. So we're really beginning to prune things. There's another really good choice we could take. <coughs> good. I, I don't think you even need to go as far as A being omega. I think if you just take B to be the empty set, I think that's enough. So let's try. If B is the empty set, then we get the probability of A is C1 probability of A plus 0 plus 0. So what do we know about C1? C1 has to be 1. We would have gotten this if we had also taken A to be omega, but we can actually be you know, a little bit more general. All right, building on the success of taking B equals the empty set, what should we try now? A is the empty set. The other thing we know is the formula needs to be symmetric in A and B. A purely, without even doing any calculations, if I just change what I'm calling A and B, it shouldn't change what's going on over here. Right? I can change the order in writing these two sets. What do we know about C1 and C2 just by general symmetry principles? We, we, do know that we know initially that they're equal. So these are equal by symmetry. Symmetry is a wonderful thing to exploit. Okay? In, uh, I think, chapter 3, I start talking about tic-tac-toe, maybe chapter 4, talking about tic-tac-toe, how to analyze tic-tac-toe. I am the undisputed champion at the elementary school playground in tic-tac-toe. I have yet to be defeated by any of the little brats, uh, so any of the uh, <laughs> young scholars. I have been tied once, though. I did have a bad day. One of the kids did tie me. I will talk to you about how to analyze tic-tac-toe using this idea of symmetry. Initially, how many moves do you think there are in tic-tac-toe for the first person? Nine. But if you think about it, the four corners are equivalent, the four middles are equivalent, and then the center is different. There's really only three moves by symmetry. And you can really prune down the analysis. Over here, we can basically argue whatever the answer is, it has to be symmetric in the probability of A, probability of B. Whatever functional form, C1 has to be C2. If we don't see that, we just do if A equals the empty set, that implies C2 equals 1. I, do we need any more cases? Yeah, now we know C3 equals 1. Or negative 1. Conclude C3 equals negative 1. This is all assuming it takes that form. This is experimental mathematics. So as C1 plus C2 plus C3 equals 1 without thinking at all about Venn diagrams and intersections and whatnot. Just saying, look, the only things in play are the probability of A, probability of B, probability of A intersect B. If I'm trying to find the union, the probability that the union happens, it should be a function of these three things. There shouldn't be anything else that matters. And just using that, I want to try to build up a possible functional form. If I started having squares and cubes, I might then have some issues. You know, as, 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 if I take B to be the empty set, it's got to reduce to just the probability of A. And so, you know, again, this is not a proof. This is just highly suggestive that the answer should be probability of A plus probability of B minus the probability of A intersect B. And what I like about this is you now have an idea of what you should try to prove. 
And then, you know, the way you would prove this, one of the proofs is you write A union B as the union of disjoint sets. That's the main method we have of proof. So the proof is write as a disjoint union of sets. So you're going to write A union B as disjoint sets. So we can write A union B as C1 union C2 union C3. And the book goes through in detail how you would do that. And so what you can do is C1 could be all the things in A that aren't in B. So I think C1 is A intersect B complement. C2, I think, is B intersect A complement. And then C3 is A intersect B. And so you know, the details are in the book. Okay, so again, this is not a proof. I need to you know, really hammer home and emphasize that this is not a proof. But it is a great way to look at mathematics. Right now, these formulas are not that bad. The formulas are going to get far more involved as you go deeper and deeper in mathematics and finance. And you want to be able to look at something and see, is this reasonable? How do I expect it to feel? How do I expect it to vary? How many of you have seen the Pythagorean theorem? If not, you know, just raise your hand so I don't cry. You, know, you should have seen, if you have a right triangle, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I'll post some links as to how you can prove that formula just from first principles, from a dimensional analysis perspective. Anybody here taking or having taken algebraic number theory? OK, I'll post something on discriminants, that there's a way to calculate the discriminant without actually going through the detailed calculation that uh, is very, very painful. This idea of being able to look at something and get a shape of the formula can be made precise. All right, so I will be in my office from now, or whenever I'm able to walk up there, to 11.50, and then again from 1 to 1.50.